Five Nights at Freddy's is well known for inspiring thousands of developers to create fan games based on it. One of the first fan games ever created for Five Nights at Freddy's was a fan-made third installment, released on Game Jolt by a user named BFP Films on December 23, 2014. And this would spark one of the strangest stories to ever unfold in the history of the Five Nights at Freddy's community. This is the bizarre legacy of the return to Freddy's. BFP Films, who I'll refer to as Tyler from now on, was born on May 12, 2000 in Odessa, Texas. His first exposure to video games was the Crash Bandicoot series on PS2, from as early as the age of three. In 2010, he discovered that he liked bringing his stories and imagination to life through video games, so he stumbled upon a game developing software, Game Maker, and he would go on to code several Mario and Smash Bros. fan games. Two years later, he came across the horror games Slender the Eight Pages and Amnesia the Dark Descent, two classic hallmarks of the indie horror genre. These were certainly the two most popular games at the time related to horror, and came directly before Five Nights at Freddy's, so it's clear to see where some of his inspiration may have come from. If we fast forward a little to his early teenage years, we get to the first release of Five Nights at Freddy's, and then the release of Five Nights at Freddy's 2. Shortly after Five Nights at Freddy's 2 came out, he decided that it would be a cool idea to make a fan game and market it as Five Nights at Freddy's 3. The story behind this first game is pretty rudimentary, but I'll read the summary. When Mike Schmidt was about to quit his job, he found an article on the newspaper mentioning the animatronics being fixed. The ever so popular pizzeria's animatronics have been fixed and repaired at last. They have also fixed and brought back everyone's favorite pirate fox, Foxy. The murderer of the four children and one missing child has yet to be found. They also brought back something from the old pizzeria, something to bring back to the hopes and joys of children and grown-ups alike. But the building has yet to be cleaned. Not responsible for injury or dismemberment, $150 a week. To apply, call 1-888-FAZ-FAZBEAR. After releasing his fan-made FNAF 3 game, many people would mistakenly and understandably believe that it was the actual Five Nights at Freddy's 3, as the hype for this sequel was at a high at the time. Because of this, many people took to emailing Scott Cawthon personally about the game, and he eventually reached out to Tyler about removing the game from Game Jolt or renaming it. Obviously, Tyler opted for the latter. Now let's talk about the actual gameplay. It's, um... Ah, how do I say this? It's really questionable. Everything in the game is just stolen or reused assets. Even the Freddy render on the newspaper is stolen from an artist named Nexus Drakeson. It even includes a character that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, but at the time, Emil's candy animatronic, being called Sugar in this game, didn't have their own fan game franchise. The jump scare for this character was literally just Toy Bonnie's jump scare with Candy's head poorly photoshopped on top of it. Originally, the doors were also able to be freely opened and closed, although they did nothing to aid the player, and strangely also didn't contribute towards loss of power. I'd also like to note that all of the events in this game are actually scripted, so in other words, there's no RNG at all. It goes without saying that this game is a bit of a mess, which would be a trend with all of Tyler's games. The phone guy in this game is voiced by him, and let's just say his writing and voice acting skills aren't anything to be jealous of. Upon the game's rebranding, the title was changed to The Return to Freddy's, and some minor gameplay changes were made. The visuals of the doors were changed to reflect that they couldn't do anything, and the candy ripoff character was removed to appease those who were complaining about it, at least for now. Now, this game actually had death mini games, like FNAF 2. There's this random human character whose art style does not match anything else around him, and I honestly can't even make any sense of the narrative these minigames are trying to convey. Uh, apparently, one of the random child characters in a minigame where you play as Sugar 
was named Emil Mako, which was the creator of the actual animatronic. So he was just like making fun of the fact that he stole someone's OC. I don't know. He was definitely aware of Emil's existence and, and blatantly stole the character. The minigame ends with this random black character wearing a hat that is definitely just the puppet jump scare poorly edited. Okay. And that's all the first game has to offer. A few months would pass, and on March 8th, Tyler would release the next game in the franchise, the Return to Freddy's 2. Chronologically, this takes place before the first game, and is meant to take place at Fred Bear's Family Diner, which we find out about in Five Nights at Freddy's 2. I think the name of the place was Fred Bear's Family Diner or something like that. Tyler actually began using his own assets from this game forward, but it's obvious that he had no prior 3D modeling experience before this, which is fine. I mean, I'm not gonna make fun of him for not being a good beginner artist, but yeah. Let's talk about the characters. Now, although the models aren't blatantly stolen anymore, the character of Sugar is still present, definitely despite the wishes of its original creator. He also made an alternative pink version of the character Kitty Fazcat, who was an insert for his ex-girlfriend. Upon their breaking up, uh, he would later go on to be cited saying that she was actually his least favorite animatronic. I, I wonder why. And the original Kitty Fazcat would also go on to change her name to bar any association with the Godforsaken franchise. Oh, good on you, man, really. This character would be the first of many inserts and self-inserts throughout his games, and only one of his many cringe-worthy development tendencies. The character you play as in this game is Conneth Cotts, which we all know who that's meant to be. Oh my god, why is this guy so fucking cringe, man? Okay, um, apparently the phone guy in this game is voiced by him again, and their name is Allison. A dog animatronic, Doug, becomes active on Night 4. For some reason, he only appears in this game, with nothing but a slight cameo in the next game, and then he vanishes without a trace. This game also introduces Lockjaw, which in itself is way too similar to Springtrap in name for me to be comfortable with its originality. Later, we'd find out that his name is Frank Burt, but that's, that's for later. The only real appearance of Lockjaw in this game is as a rare easter egg and in hallucinations in the later nights. Buckle up, because we're going to be seeing a lot of this Lockjaw character. Anyways, now let's move on to the gameplay. Yeah, uh, it's just FNAF 2 with extra steps. <laughs> Tyler's really not great at designing games, especially his earlier ones. There's a mask with a toxic meter, again, like the first game, and there's also a music box and a generate power button that functions essentially exactly like the music box. At first, the Return to Freddy's 2 was just using his first game's code as a base, but he would eventually go on to steal Scott's code for the mask mechanic in the later build of the game. Like its predecessor, this game also had death minigames, whose narrative that I also cannot make any sense of. But there seems to be a human child character that vaguely resembles Lockjaw's appearance, for some reason. And the child is named BFP. Another shameless, cringeworthy self-insert. Okay. From there, you can assume that the entire Lockjaw character is kind of also a shameless self-insert, which the wiki confirms. Funnily enough, Tyler would go on to say that this was one of his favorite characters, which mirrored what he said about his ex-girlfriend's character Kitty being one of his least favorite. This dude really wears his heart on his sleeve, huh? Jesus. Only a month later, Tyler would release the third game in his series, The Return to Freddy's 3. His third game isn't much more impressive than what we've already talked about. For one, the atmosphere is ripped straight from FNAF 3, though at least the environment and character models are better, for sure. For some reason, Sugar's head is on the floor outside the office and the character is no longer present, so I guess he finally decided to stop including a stolen character design in his narrative. 
though a new snake animatronic was added in the absence of the character, which is cool, I guess. Uh, he's, he's cool, whatever. Let's talk about the gameplay. So in this game, the character you play as is Blake, and the phone guys are Blake's friends. Hey Blake, how's it going? Uh, you're probably wondering why we called you to help us out with this. The friend group's goal was to take this abandoned restaurant and turn it into some kind of entertainment attraction called Fazbear Fantasyland. And the newspaper says, a new entertainment is close to opening its, it is doors, okay, and reveal the legend from the past. What? They only have a few more things to salvage before it officially opens. The new entertainment is to be called Fazbear Fantasyland. God, oh my God. reading anything written by Tyler just physically hurts me. Okay, um, each night new animatronics get added. And it's going to be a trend for me to call these minigames nonsense, but the Night 5 minigame is actually kind of important. So you play as the purple guy, who is Vincent in this universe, since a lot of people around that time in the FNAF community would refer to him by that name, before we got the real name, William Afton. The child with the hat we've been seeing, the shameless self-insert BFP, seems to attempt to hide from Vincent in the lockjaw suit and is crushed by the spring locks. Therefore, we, at the very least, know why Lockjaw is possessed. Upon completing Night 6, we're treated to the ending of the game, where the possessed Lockjaw animatronic kills six children, and the government plans to destroy the animatronics and anything else left in the building by demolishing it. The Return to Freddy's 4 marks the last game that Tyler would actually fully complete and release. This game is probably the best one that he actually finished, though Tyler actually said this was his least favorite game, which is kind of funny considering what I just said. I will be honest, I don't actually know what the hell Tyler was thinking when he made this game's story though. The plot summary is as follows. 15 years after Fazbear Fantasyland has been demolished, the government has come to a decision to make animatronics legal again. Oh, dude. For what reason? I couldn't possibly tell you. Okay, uh, let's see. What they don't realize is the terrible mistake they just made. Oh my god, it's so edgy. It's so cringe. Jesus Christ. <sighs> okay, uh, anyways. Since you reprised your role as Blake, again, basically the plot is exactly the same as the third game, but just takes place 15 years later arbitrarily. At the very least, Chica, Foxy, and Vigo, the snake animatronic, are absent, so it's kind of the only thing that the third game's narrative actually affects in this game. The night completion minigames in this game for once are actually rather straightforward. You play as Vincent and do what I assume is to kill a child for the first four nights, and on night five, you find a separate green human character. He seems to be torturing BFP, which I guess would place this event before he dies in the Lockjaw suit. It's, it's really weird. I honestly have no idea because I'm not even going to attempt to piece together the series timeline or lore or whatever. That is not my problem. There's no way that I would spend time doing that. Oh yeah, and uh, for some reason, this green human character, his name is Gron. Really great uh, character naming you got there, Tyler. Really, really cool. Uh, anyways, uh, you see that white square on the floor? Uh, what do you think it is? Let me let me give you some some time to, to guess. Did you answer D, a bar of fucking soap? Well, if you did, for some reason, you're actually correct. Yeah, it's a bar of fucking soap. I don't know why it's there, but it's soap. And you see that golden lockjaw suit? Yeah. Despite how idiotic it is, and how little it makes sense, you, you already know. You already know what's gonna happen. You know what's gonna- He slips on the soap, and he manages to fit himself inside of an entire fucking animatronic suit on accident after slipping on soap on the floor for no reason, and the spring locks kill him, and Gron is dead. Or something. Like fantastic, uh, just stellar writing, Tyler. You're 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 doing great. You're doing great, buddy. <sighs> so far, things are pretty straightforward with just four games that all ended up releasing. No cancellations, no reboots, nothing. But from now on, things are gonna get a lot more complicated. 
Originally, the next game would have been the Return to Freddy's Remastered. The development was meant to be started after the third game was completed, but the game's old page was taken down instantly, basically, probably before he even began making the game. Later, it was renamed the Return to Freddy's Rebooted, and then he changed his mind again and just went with the basic the Return to Freddy's 5, and that name stuck. It was announced on May 26th, 2015, leading up to the release of a demo, which is the only real gameplay that we ever received for this game. Tyler would release a handful of teaser games as well. Then the demo was released, and in terms of technical prowess, it was actually kind of impressive. Making a free roam game in Click Team is definitely not as easy of a task as it sounds. The story went as follows. You're an investigator. It's, it is year 2036. Everyone but you stepped down on a cold case of the mysteries and murders of Fazbear Incorporated. You are alive. You are the child from the past. <sighs> Thanks, Tyler. What thrilling and vague storytelling. Very, very well crafted. Okay. So in the demo, once you make it to the second to last floor, you set fire to the factory and attempt to escape by going to the next and final floor. In this game, Tyler introduced the concept of the torture animatronics, which were originally referred to as the hybrid animatronics. And on the final floor, an animatronic named the torture device is present. The game originally was meant to have 15 endings, but it only ended up having nine because he couldn't come up with enough ideas. Why, why would you say that you wanted 15 endings if you didn't even have the ideas to make 15 endings? Just make as many as you think you can make and then say that that's how many there are going to be. Like, why, why does it have to be so complicated with you, Tyler? Every time. <sighs> Anyways, in an ending where you don't interact with the torture device and leave it be, apparently all of the animatronics escape the factory and cause the apocalypse. The true ending happens when you, for whatever reason, purposefully get into the torture device and die. As a quick side note, this game was originally also meant to have a separate adventure mode that would play similarly to FNAF World. A kind of weird detail, but I figured I should at least mention it. In November of that same year, Tyler began to work on a separate spin-off project along with Bio Ninja Games, named Frank Burtz. A few days later, the game was changed from being a spin-off project to an official installment set in the main The Return to Freddy's universe. This is where we find out Lockjaw's real name. It was being developed alongside The Return to Freddy's 5, and during the night shift the player would have been able to move back and forth inside the security office. In the backside of the office, there would have been a vent that the player could hide inside of by clicking it and then crawl to the dining area, where the player would have had a 360 degree view and vice versa. Since the animatronics could appear in any area at the same time, including behind your back in the vents, the player would have had to keep crawling to the other side and survive until 8am. The game was also planned to implement a cinematic cutscene, where the protagonist would have been introduced to the establishment. Through some images we received, the floor plan for the setting was very similar to Fazbear Fantasyland from The Return to Freddy's 3, which sure certainly checks out. Apparently it was a, wait, wait, wait. It was a strip club used as a low cover criminal institute and disguised as a closed down children's play area. Jesus fucking Christ. <sighs> Just one month later though, Tyler gave up on game development after being directed by his therapist that it had too much of a negative impact on his mental health. You, you don't say. <laughs> he would abruptly quit game development, passing the project on to Yin Koyu. However, this was just a cry for attention, the first of many, because people quickly found out that this was just Tyler on an alt account. Okay. Um, and in October of 2016, he gave Toonster and Tanner Feline the ownership and rights over the entire The Return to Freddy's saga. A few months later in December, Toonster and Tanner Feline will split up, deciding to make their own individual versions of The Return to Freddy's 5 after Toonster said he wanted to change the lore, which Feline didn't agree with. Because of this, later that month, 
Tyler decided to suddenly revoke their ownership of the series and instead pass it on to Bio Ninja Games. He ultimately decided to change the lore just like Toonster had wanted to, and also decided to remove some of the characters and give the torture animatronics new models. Bio Ninja Games' version of the Return to Freddy's 5 was set to release on April 15th, 2017. On January 6, 2017, Tanner Feline decided to cancel his version of the game. Exactly one month after that happened, on February 6th, Bio Ninja Games cancelled his version of the game as well due to the massive backlash that it got from him wanting to change the lore. Before we move on to the next section, I did want to mention two fan games that Tyler at some point said it were canon. Uh, not much information is known about these two games, and I just wanted to make sure that they were in the video in some capacity. Now, rewinding the timeline just a little bit, on December 1st, 2016, Tyler released an entire official novel to flesh out the lore for his series, The Return to Freddy's The Dreadful Truth. To even call it a novel sounds like an insult to all novels across the world. It's literally a downloadable .txt file on a Game Jolt page. When I say that this is peak of Tyler's absolutely awful writing, I mean it. I was originally going to summarize the novel for the sake of this video, but reading it quickly became tedious to the point that it was genuinely insufferable and it's several times longer than this script, so I'm not doing that. If I were to do it, it would also bloat the runtime and ruin the video pacing. All you really need to know is that Super Cancer is an actual major plot point in the novel. If that doesn't tell you what you need to know, I don't know what will. If you really want to read it, which I don't recommend, you can go ahead and do it yourself. I'll leave it in the description. Or, you can watch a 30-minute video by Eclipse that summarizes it, which is an option that I recommend a lot more. In late 2017, Tyler announced on his Twitter that he was planning on making a remake of the novel, and that he was going to release it within spring of 2018. It was going to be completely rewritten from the ground up, with many more details, to extend it to a length more comparable to the average several hundred page novel. Obviously, nothing from this announcement ever came to fruition. Despite being warned by his therapist, Tyler would eventually make his return less than a year later, starting a new game with help from his brother Sean. The Return to Freddy's Chapter 1 began its development in the middle of 2017 and was announced publicly on August 28th, 2017. The goal was to remake the original Return to Freddy's game, and from there, reboot the subsequent games in the series for an overall total series reboot. For some reason, the game was to be released on a closed launcher named the Omega Launcher, which was likely because it was being developed by a friend of Tyler's. Unsurprisingly, this launcher was eventually cancelled. The game was also intended to have voice acting, with many characters having at least alleged confirmed roles casted. Tyler put together a game development group named Kriya Studios that would be responsible for developing the new series of games. Everything before the Return to Freddy's Chapter 1 would be under the Return to Freddy's Volume 1, and everything after under Volume 2. The story was labeled as a whole different chapter in the Return to Freddy's story, and we were told to forget everything that we thought we knew. This makes sense, I guess, since Lockjaw wouldn't even be present as the main antagonist this time around, according to the wiki. The plot went like this. James Calfron, a retired patrol officer, takes the job as the night watchman for Freddy Emporium, a children's playhouse that serves tacos and waffles for the likes of children and adults. 
James, however, had experienced a trauma from his past that lurks back to haunt him. And from this day forward, he will experience a series of events that he will never understand nor ever forget. Almost no information about the gameplay is known, but it appeared to be some form of free roam, I guess, as there were several locations shown that the player could have been in. An AC unit was mentioned in the text of one of the teasers, which moves around the building and can be adjusted. BFP said in the, the Return to Freddy's Q&A video that the game was to be nearly as big as Amnesia. Wow, he was delusional, hinting that the game would have been much larger than any of the previous The Return to Freddy's games. Tyler also said that the game should be expected by March or April of 2018. The game was supposed to have a trailer slated for November 15th, 2017, but Tyler cited computer limitations that didn't allow him to finish it on time. He then said the trailer would be pushed to sometime in March or April 2018, which is confusing since this was the original release date. However, when the date rolled around, the game was just cancelled altogether, and the trailer was never even finished. Though it's fairly obvious that Tyler cancelled the game because the project's scope was likely far too vast and he was in over his head in many ways, the reason that he cited was that he decided to completely remove all of the Five Nights at Freddy's characters and assets from the game, and to make the game its own unique intellectual property. TRTF, the acronym, was altered to mean The Road That Falls. From here, Kriya Studios was now responsible for The Road That Falls. Tyler put a lot of work into planning what the story of this game was going to be. However, over time, his scope kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And in 2019, he would delete many of his accounts and become inactive on those that remained. And it seemed like Tyler's story had finally come to an end. Though Korea Studios still existed, years went by and nothing seemed to be happening. Tyler and The Return to Freddy's seemed to be over. That is, until four months ago. About three weeks after this trailer dropped, Kriya Studios would begin an ARG on their channel, hinting towards another new project. Perhaps a new era of The Return to Freddy's is just around the corner, and hardly anyone even knows about it. I think it's worth mentioning that, on top of all of the developments happening at Korea Studios, many indie developers over the years have created various remakes and many revivals of The Return to Freddy's 5 and previous entries. The Return to Freddy's 2 Winter Wonderland, which has been used as the background footage for the past few minutes, is probably the best example of this. Even though the series is almost as old as Five Nights at Freddy's itself, it's still affecting the community to this day, and even if it's mediocre, I'm sure many still have plenty of fond memories related to it. In the end, Tyler might have been a bit of a strange person and a worse developer, but he's still a human being. And at the end of the day, he was just doing what he loved to do. Make video games. That's all from me. Thanks for watching. Until next time.